We are joined by Dr. Kevin Donnelly, who has written a piece titled Temptations of the Digital World, which asks the question, is it time to ban smartphones for children? Kevin, welcome to Spectator TV. Always a pleasure, Alexandra. Thank you for having me on the show. Now, Kevin, this is a topic that small government conservatives and libertarians struggle with, the banning of smartphones for kids. Now, to be clear, we're not talking about those old Nokias that pretty much only make phone calls so kids can keep in touch with their parents. We're talking about smartphones that come with social media apps that today's generation obsess over. So, Kevin, which side of the fence do you fall down on? To ban or not to ban? Well, in, in this case, definitely ban. That doesn't mean forever, but I'd certainly be saying as a parent and an educator and somebody who's been involved in the battle of ideas, as John Howard calls it, I'd be saying that uh, young children, primary school, should not have these smartphones. I wouldn't have them in the school or at home. I would ban them totally. Uh, young children, primary school age, they really should be free-range kids they should be learning how to catch a ball, kick a footy, ride bikes, climb trees. I mean, all of the stuff that we did, our, you know, the, the baby boomers, all the stuff we did, uh, that's what young people should be doing, young children, because that is critically important for uh, a lot of reasons, partly because it teaches independence, resilience and socialising with other young kids. So I'd be banning it in primary school and for young children. Well, I'm going to read a quote from your article, quote, as I warned in 2014, the digital world, while incredibly tempting and widely endorsed, represents a Faustian bargain guaranteed to cause more harm than good. Over the last 10 years, the impact of the influence of digital technology has grown exponentially. And Haydet's book is a much needed wake up call for parents, teachers and policymakers. Kevin, what did you mean by a Faustian bargain in this context? Because, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting topic and I don't think a lot of people understand exactly what kids are getting themselves into and what this trade-off between digital progress is and the well-being of children. It's a complicated issue and uh, I suppose what I mean by this, and I can remember Kevin Rudd when he was Prime Minister, uh, launching what he called the toolbox of the future. He put millions and millions of dollars into computers in schools uh, on the argument that it would help to raise standards. In fact, it, it did the opposite. I mean, all the research has shown since then that Australian standards have gone backwards. And when you look at the stronger performing overseas countries in Europe and East Asia, they didn't do all the computer networking, internet access in schools. They relied on uh, teaching young kids memorisation, rote learning. I've always argued for years now, you have a very good computer, it's sitting on your shoulders. And if you look at the research that Baroness Greenfeld has carried out in England, what they, what they learn with cognitive research is, or you know, brain development, young children need to hardwire the brain before they can be creative and to do more complex, difficult things. And the problem with computers and screens and smartphones is that they're not learning the basics. They're not learning how to hardwire their brain, as it were, so they can then go on and do more difficult work. So if you're looking at education in schools, I'd be arguing cut it right back. Uh, that doesn't mean you abolish it in secondary school, but certainly in primary school I wouldn't be using computers or smartphones. I think I might disagree with you on that one because the modern world is different and computing technology and di the digital world is a function of our society now, whether we like it or not, and children do need to grow up comfortable with these technologies, but I do think there is a balance to be struck. Uh, when I was growing up, we came, like, video games had just started. I think I was 11 when the first PlayStation came out. And we were told that playing games would be bad for us, but the games that we played as children were extremely difficult, problem-solving puzzle games. And so what happened is our generation actually came out with excellent hand-eye coordination and very good problem-solving skills because we'd spend days locked in some game room trying to solve a complicated problem. But that is not the same games that kids are playing today, which teach them to have short attention spans 
fans, and and uh, th it's a very different um, set of things. So I think the it's not one idea. It's not all video games are bad. It really depends what it is. And I'd say the same thing of not all computing is bad. So. I learned how to type when I was in high school on insistence of my mother who used to do shorthand and, and all that sort of thing. And that was a great skill. But most of the kids reaching high school these days can't type despite spending all their time on computers. So what they learn on computers I think is important. And we also had a balance. We had to commit all our essays by hand. We still had to have that balance between the two and now we are losing that balance. So that would be my two cents worth for that. But when listening to arguments about the topic, I notice people talk across one another. You've got people who've got pe their kids there and they're seeing serious harm and then there's people like you and me who never grew up with the, the bullying and what happens to kids online. Do you think this, there's a misunderstanding about the true nature of the problem, Kevin? I think a lot of parents and, uh, you know, even parents that I know, uh, family members, the temptation is to use screens, computers, a as uh, babysitters when you've got young children, I mean, parents, often they're both working. It's very difficult. There's a lot of, uh, well, they're time poor, frankly. And so often they'll put kids in front of the screen. And I'm sure it's happened to you as well. If you go out and have a coffee Saturday morning or on a Sunday, you often see a family sitting around having coffee or breakfast and the kids have got their iPads and their phones and the parents have got their phones and there's no interaction. I mean, there's no conversation. So that's part of the problem that I would argue people are inherently social. We're social animals and we rely on that physical interface, whether it's eye contact, whether it's just being physically close, uh, talking to one another, uh, facial gestures, eye contact, as I said. All of that is critically important because what tends to happen, if you're living in that virtual world all the time, you're not aware of the need to be civil, to be polite, to actually engage with people. And the other problem uh, that Jonathan Haidt talks about in his book is the growth of cyberbullying, sexting, a word I'd never heard of, sextortion. Sextortion, where apparently young boys are tricked into sending photos of their private parts and then, unless they pay money, those pictures will be circulated to their networks and family. So it's actually a very dangerous world in this virtual digital world and unfortunately a lot of parents increasingly are not aware. They think it's something that's straightforward but in fact it's not. Well, let's. I, I will give you that smartphones can be damaging to children. Not always, it depends on how they're used, but they can be damaging to children. I'm not going to fight that at all. The question comes, and this is where the libertarians and the conservatives have a, have a conflict here, is whose responsibility is it to police this? Do we really have to ban it for all children when I guarantee you a, a vast number of them, it's beneficial for them and then there's a, there's a, it depends on what kind of situation they grow up in where it becomes harmful. Now, why isn't it the parent's responsibility? Because frankly, you know, my mother would tell me that's enough, go to bed and I would be taken off me and that's, that was how it was and my, our parents were strict and they gave us boundaries. Why aren't the parents today simply parenting their children properly? And, what, and schools have the power to ban phones in class. Ours are banned. They have to sit in our bags. Why isn't this a private issue? Why does the state have to get involved? Well, initially I'd argue, as you do, it's a parent's responsibility. And uh, I'd be saying to parents, I think you mentioned, when kids go to bed at night, no screens, no phones, nowhere near the bedroom. Keep it away. In New South Wales, they've actually stopped uh, kids taking their phones into school. So they're banning them in schools now, which I think is a great thing. Yeah. So parents are primarily responsible. Governments can do more. But there's an added question here. I mean, uh, my daughter, Amelia, she's very wary of using her iPhone because her argument is if you do believe in the global reset, in the fact that Big Brother is watching if you've got your phone, as you know, government can track you, other people can track your spending. That's why I'm a great believer in using cash and not uh, digital currency. I mean, there's the whole other argument here that, you know, the Big Brother argument, 1984, where if we're continually 
online, as it were, in the virtual world, then there, there are government and other state actors who are actually gathering all that information about you. So well, it, you, it's you, a dangerous world, as I said. You raise a, an important point here. We're almost out of time. But one thing that the younger generations struggle with, so not just the ones growing up now, but the ones who've just left school, is that everything you put on social media is forever. And so they are... They're putting all this stuff online, embarrassing things that they think is fun when they're at school, and then they go to get a job and realise that these photographs are going to haunt them for the rest of their lives. These comments they put up as a teenager are there forever. Do you think that perhaps if we are going to legislate something, it should be along the lines of the right to forget laws, which can instruct social media companies to properly delete content of minors if they have request it? Uh, and also, perhaps, maybe we should lean on schools to say, you know what, we're going to ensure that there is balance for children, at least at school when they, where they're most vulnerable. Would that be the kind of interference that perhaps would be warranted from the state, which still leaves the rest of the parenting up to the parents? The short answer is yes. I mean, if I was managing a school, I'd be saying no, no iPhones. I'd be limiting the use of computers. Uh, and I get back to the point that, you know, Things like eye-hand coordination, a lot of overseas countries, uh, especially in Europe, are actually going back to teaching handwriting in school because it's that eye-hand coordination that is so critical in terms of cognitive development. The other thing is reading a printed page has been shown to be more effective in terms of remembering what you're reading to reading a screen. So... It's not as simple as people think. I mean, what troubled me uh, some years ago was that schools were using all of this technology as a marketing tool. They were saying, we've got computers, we've got iPads, we're online 24-7. But in fact, I'd be pulling back from that. Uh, and as I said, schools should be banning it, uh, certainly in primary school. Parents have a responsibility. But often, if you've got these big global networks who are running uh, a lot of the background in terms of the games kids are playing or the interface in terms of whether it's a social networking site, often governments will have to st step in there and really monitor what these big global companies are doing. You know, I, I agree with you about the whole uh, writing things down to learn more effectively. That My father's one of the first people to build computers in Australia. And so I, as a, as a very small child, I was playing on these very early computers. And so even though I had access to this technology before a lot of other people, I would write down all my notes for school by hand all the way through to the HSC. And so would my friends, and that is how we learned. We submitted assignments via the computer and did all of our learning with a physical pen and paper, and that is a great way to achieve a balance. But I fear that the ease of chatbots and submitting essays via, you know, eff it's effectively cheating is currently a, a temptation that we have not yet learned as a society to resist, and it may take us a few generations to adapt to our new reality of the digital world. But look, I'd like to thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us here today on Spectator TV and for your wonderful article, and let's hope that our kids can find some way out of this mess. Thank you very much.